The Bothy Storytelling Podcast is a member of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB. Welcome to the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. I'm your host, Callum Lycan, and here we are with the second in my challenge for the week to get as many out to you to make up for lost time. And this episode, well, Burns is back. Yet we had Rabbi Burns Day again, so this is going to be a wee bit more on Burns. But before we kick on with the bard, let's have a word from one of our sponsors. Let's do coffee by the Moji Centre at Nate, hosted by Daniel Van Velen and produced by the Moji Centre for New Venture and Student Entrepreneurship at Nate. Each episode features an interview with a student entrepreneur or Nate alumnus. They dive into topics that explore their challenges, questions and fears involved in operating their companies. It comes out every two weeks, and if you're interested in finding out more, find the show at nate.ca slash Modji Centre. That's nate.ca slash Modji Centre. And that's for Let's Do Coffee by the Modji Centre at Nate, hosted by Daniel Van Velen. When Chapman Billy's leave the street and Druthy Niebuhr's Niebuhr's meet... As market days are wearing late and folk begin to tack the gate, while we sit boozing at the nappy and getting foo and unca happy, we think na on the lang Scot smiles, the mosses, water slaps and styles that lie between us and our hame, where sits our sulky, sullen dame, gathering her brows like gathering storm, nursing her wrath to keep it warm. This truth and honest tamashanter, as he fe air a night did canter, old air, when near a town surpasses for honest men, and Bonnie lassies. The opening lines to the famous Tam Shanter by Rabbi Burns. Now, I've been doing a lot of Burns events again. You know, every year I seem to get a few more, which is wonderful. You know, that makes me really happy because the more of these events I do, the better. And, you know, I am from Ayrshire. I'm from Burns country. I was born less than five miles away from where the man himself was born. So we get taught a lot of it in school. I mentioned all this in last year's episode. But, you know, I've been doing all these events, and one of the funniest things that I get is I always admit that I'm not a fan of Burns's poetry. I really like the man himself, just not necessarily as much about his poetry, although his poetry is great. I mean, damn a shanter. Oh, brilliant to a haggis it's all there you know these are great pieces but I find him much more interesting as a fellow so I've been doing all these um events and talking about Robert Burns and his history and telling stories because what I discovered about Burns was although he was a great poet a a scholar he was an educated man by school and self-educated he was as everyone knows a lover of the ladies you know, that was one of the great things about him that everyone speaks about. You know, you get the ode to the lassies and all that. Um, but basically, you know, Burns was formidable in his love life. But what I discovered is he was also a great believer and a great man for the stories. He had an aunt or a maid that would sit and tell him stories about all the local folk and fairy tales, the beasties of Scotland. And this fascinated Burns so much so that, you know, when you look at a piece, I mean, I've got I've got Tam O'Shanter printed out here, but when you look at Tam O'Shanter, you see, you know, those sections that are inspired by the folk and fairy tales. Warlocks and witches in a dance. Ne Cotland Brent, ne Free France. Uh, yeah. But hornpipes, jigs, thraspes and reels put life and metal in their heels. You know, there sat old Nick in shape a beast, 
a towsy tyke, black, grim and large. You know, there's so much in there inspired by folk tales. And as you can see, I'm not great with Tam O'Shant or some of that. I'm struggling with the language because it's all Scots, even though in Ayrshire we still kind of have a little bit of that dialect going on. Totally struggle with it myself because, you know, I've become gentrified. Yes. I moved to Edinburgh, you know, out east, where they they don't appreciate the heathenistic ways of our West Coast mannerisms. So, you know, I had to gentrify myself. Uh, <laughs> didn't he work? No, didn't he work at all? But, you know, one lacks to believe I became a little bit more sophisticated. But I loved Burns and, you know, I was having great times doing these events and I was telling stories like the Selkie Wife or the Lonely Fisherman is the variation I tell and you know of course he's patriotism patriotism patriot, patriotism yes one cannot speak um, his patriotic manner for his country you know as I was telling some stories about uh, Robert the Bruce you know and of course Scots Wahiwi Wallace bled Scots when Bruce has often led welcome to your gory bed or to victory you know the great Scots Wahi ah, that was spontaneous <laughs> look at that I might have actually learned a verse of it in a year um <laughs> But no, I love Robert the Robert the Bruce. I do love Robert the Bruce as well, but I love Robbie Burns. You know, his uh, whole life, you know, his poetry, everything, there's so much story in there. His life is an epic story, and I'm not going to go into it because I remember last year we went over the immortal memory that I wrote, that one of the very first second episodes of this illustrious and, of course, very regular podcast, Don't Start, okay? I'm trying to make up for it. Just please accept it. But yeah, um, Rabbi Burns, love it. So I did all these events. I was up through in Edmonton. I did uh, Chianti's Restaurant, which is uh, one of the Tales Edmonton chapters. And then I was out at a library, the uh, Temporary Sherwood Park Library. Oh, yeah, Temporary. Yeah, you heard that right. Someone apparently tried to blow up the last one. Guys. What's this world coming to when someone's trying to blow up a library? Or I think it was the parkade connected to the library. Something weird like that. I don't know quite the full story. It was madness, I tell you. Why would anyone do such a thing? So I was in the Templey... Templey? Oh, God. <laughs> oh. Today, English is brought to you by Callum Ligon, where we reinvent the words. <laughs> um... You know, the temporary library I was in, and it was great fun. You know, a lovely crowd talking about Burns, telling some stories. So I had some really good times, and I also did a lovely place, the Calgary Wright Winters Club, not Writers, Winters Club, asked me to come out, and that was a lovely event as well. You know, they fed me, they treated me lovely. I mean, I got fed quite a lot at these events. I've noticed it's one of the perks of the job. <laughs> I get treated well. And I had a lovely time at the Calgary Winters Club, talking about Burns, telling a few stories. So... You know, loved what I was doing. And then... <laughs> Jeez. Right, okay. Let me explain when I do this. So I introduce Robert Burns. And I introduce who he is. And I explain about the gran the maid or the aunt. But I also kind of talk about, you know, we go through the basics, very quick basics. You know, Burns, his life, his loves, his poetry, his passion for Scotland. So I talk about that and I mention about the women. And, you know, of course, I tell the, the wee story about Clarinda and Sylvanda, you know, and how he was a bit of a rogue and a rascal. And I also mention he is a man out of his time, you know, he, or should I say he's a man of the right time. Because he, his behaviour wouldn't be accepted or tolerated today. Yes, it, it probably still happens to this day. There are probably people out there, both men and women, who live, shall we say, a rather exotic and um, uh, vivaciously wild lifestyle. But, you know, the way he is as a man, he's perfect for his time because he would struggle a bit more. And I have no doubt that the women would still swoon over him, you know, put him in the context of a superstar of today. The women would swoon over him. The men would swoon over him. He would have followers. He would have romantic encounters, we'll use the polite word. But ultimately, he would not necessarily be as tolerated um, or forgiven, shall we say, because, you know, there is a degree of that for the era he was in. He is a man of his time, people. That's what I'm saying. Um, 
and I make this very, I stress this and I make jokes and I make it lighthearted because it's kind of, you know, it's not a nice subject, some of the stuff. He was a philanderer. He did cheat on his wife. You know, his wife epically said he should have two wives for the amount of bairns that my, my rabbi has. And so she kind of knew what was going on. And I have to, you know, if that quote is accurate and came from her, then she had to know about it. And she seemed a very forgiving soul. Maybe she was just quite happy to have him out the house and know on honour all the time if we're going to be crude about it um, but yeah Burns was a passionate man but he was a man of his time so I I stress all this I do I stressed everything during my talks and my stories and I told you know uh, I follow that by telling a story you know Burns was a man who loved life and he loved women and he lived in this area. So I told a very beautiful Selkie story because for a man like Burns to hear those stories, that would have been right in his wheelhouse. This beautiful, exotic creature from the sea. Oh, you know, he would have just, that would have been a dream to him. So I told that story and then I told a wee bit about Robert the Bruce because the patriotism. And then I kind of finished with a plowman sort of farmer silly humorous tale, which would have amused Burns. And these are all tales from his time and his area. Because I, I build this as tales from the land of Burns, where I'm from. So these are stories I grew up knowing as well. Now, all this I've explained, I've gone through, I've stressed areas of it you know i might have been smiling and being light-hearted but i try to also express the the reverence of the serious seriousness and i do always make those statements he's a man of his time and i think actually on one occasion i even said there is a very good chance burns would have been in jail if he was alive today simply just with you know the 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 actions of who he is uh whether i mean i've no no doubts in my mind with burns that all his encounters were consenting. You know, I might be making a bold statement, but everyone I've spoken to who studied and researched Burns is always of the same vein, that everything was consenting. There was nothing aggressive. He was a man, he was charming, he was handsome. All accounts say that. He he had men and women admiring him and swooning over him. So I'm kind of hopeful that that statement is right. Everything was consenting. But in this day and age, a man like that, you know, throwing it about a bit, he could have ran into a lot of trouble. You know, he could have got himself in trouble and potentially been in jail. And I made this statement at one of my events. So I know that I'd covered all my bases. So can you imagine the shock, horror and absolute bamboozlement when I get an e email with the feedback from the, the night and there's two bits of feedback criticising the fact that I was condoning extramarital affairs. I seemed to be revelling in it. And frankly, they felt it was disgusting and uncomfortable, the actions of such a man. And should we be glorifying such a man as Burns because of the way he was with women? And I had to sit and kind of think about this and I got what they were trying to say. But I also was just completely blown away by this because I'm like, I covered these bases. I made sure that people are aware this is a historical character. This is a very famous man The you know, A, B, C, D, E, F and G were covered to try and explain, you know, this, this was just it. And, you know, yes, Robert Burns in our day and age is probably incredibly inappropriate, but he is a national treasure. He, his poetry, his influence, come on, old Lang Syne. You know, it's sung everywhere throughout the world, every new year. But I, I, so I got on board what they were saying, but I was just so bamboozled because I just felt so like, did you guys actually listen to anything I said? Because I did make it very clear that, yes, Burns is a man of his time. He might not be appropriate now, but, you know, let's, this is who he was. These women were all pretty much consenting as far as we are concerned, and we hope that will always be the case, um, and there'll be no discoveries that shame that. But here is a man, an exotic and wonderful individual who wrote poetry about love, because when you read his poems, near enough everything is about love. There is a hint, a strong love about everything he writes. And that's, that's the emphasis of Burns to me. It's love. This is a man who wore his heart in his sleeve. He loved dearly. He loved passionately. He loved life. 
And it just, oh, it really angered me when I read one of these because it just made me feel like, you know, you've missed the point of this man, this passionate, wonderful man. And yes, he was flawed. He wasn't perfect. He's not a role model. I'm going to say that now. Nobody should have a role model like Burns. He's, um, yeah, he is in today's society wrong, but God damn it, his writings changed the world. So many love songs, so many love poems, so many letters about love. He, that's all he was. And yes, his love also formulated a lot in his loins. You know, we, we know that. There are a lot of Burns out there. As I say, in Ayrshire, we have a kind of wee expression that we're all Burns' as bastards. Um, it's, it's uh, You know, we're all Burns of Burns because there's a very good chance half of us are bloodline to Rabbi Burns. In fact, there's a very good chance half of us throughout the world are, you know, Robert Burns' bloodline. Forget Genghis Khan. They should be doing Burns' bloodline. That man was a f passionate individual. Anyway... I think I've gone off slightly on tangent here, but I couldn't believe it when I got this feedback. You know, most of it was enjoyable. There's just these two. And of course, I had to focus on the negative. I couldn't enjoy the positive because I'm Scottish. I'm a miserable old git. I'm 42. I'm becoming an old grumpy man, people. This is just out of order. Um, but yeah, I was a wee bit disheartened to see this. And I just felt it's weird as a performer. You know, you could get 100 five-star reviews, but you get one negative and it just breaks you a wee bit. It just makes you upset because I, I did just sat back and I thought to myself, did I, did I do something wrong? Did I not explain this clearly enough? Did I misrepresent? Did, you know, I, I felt upset for them not understanding Burns and what I was trying to impart. Yes, I joked and reveled about his love life, but I spoke about his patriotism for his country, his hard working. You know, this is a man that sacrificed his life. Every opportunity, and I said this as well, he did not go out for fame and glory. He got published and then he ended up back in a farm because he needed to support the family. He basically sacrificed. He's not like me, the selfish get who fucking went out. Oops, sorry for... Swearing. <laughs> Terrible sorry. Damn it, I'll need to make this an explicit episode now. Um, but he's not like me who just went out and said, damn it, I'm gonna go out and do my thing and try and forge my path. No, Burns on every opportunity ended up back in the farm supporting his family. This is a man dedicated to his family as much as to what he wanted to be, which is fame and fortune as becoming a world-famous poet or becoming a celebrity. He had a small inkling of it. He had a taste of it. He was the most famous man in Edinburgh for a while. People were loving him. And he had to walk away from it. Do you know how hard it is to walk away as a performer from the potential of being the most famous, most loved performer in that area? That must have been so tough for Burns. So that's why I got a wee bit angry about this because it was like, I've gone through all these, I've spoken about all this and yet these people focused on this one wee negative aspect, which I don't even think was that negative because you know what? At the end of the day, he was a man of his time. He loved life. He loved women. He he did his thing. He, he did his thing and I hope nobody's picking this up wrong when I'm saying it because even as I'm talking, I'm like, oh my God, people are thinking I'm going to be some sort of misogynistic swine. And I'm not. I, I'm a very dedicated man. I'm getting married this year. Boom. You know, I've been with uh, my fiance now for over two years. Boom. That's it. You know, that's my life. There's no, I don't, I don't go out there. So I'm not one of those assholes. Um, so I look at Burns and yeah, he was, he was an unusual guy. He went out. He he wasn't... I don't know. It's weird to say because he kept going back to his wife. She seemed to be understanding. She seemed to know what was going on. She accepted it. You, you just have to make of that what you want, guys. It's not my world. It's not my... Not anymore. No, I mean, what? Who said that? What? Echo? Weird. Um, But yeah, the reality is that just really kind of annoyed me because, you know... I I love Burns as a character. I love his story. This is Zay's poems. I really love. I just, they don't connect with me as much. But I get who this guy is. And I love who this guy is. And that just really upset me. Because this is like my national, one of my national characters. You know, he was, he was voted the number one Scotsman of all time. You know? So in a country, we, we you know, everyone loves Scotland. So we can't be wrong. He must have been a nice guy. 
He must have been. I hope. You've got me thinking now. Stop, stop it. I can see your eyes questioning me. But anyway, that just kind of really, it made me sad, you know, those two wee bits of negative criticism. But they weren't necessarily, one of them was at me, which annoyed me because apparently I reveled in uh, the fact that he was a philandering swine. It was like, I didn't revel in that. I just tried to not get into a dark debate or create an evening which was supposed to be lighthearted and fun and go into this negative, go, oh, yes, Robert Burns, yes, he should have been burned. Ah, if I had my way, I'd have taken him down the high street here, we'd have strapped him to the market cross there and we'd have fired up the, the flames and castrated him with the hot, hot pincery devices. Yes. Uh, you know, jeez, that would have just ruined the night, wouldn't it? Jeez, be a bloody witch trial for Rabbi Burns. Anyway, um, where, 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 where uh, Burns? Yes, um, we all love Robert Burns. He's, he is the bard of Scotland. He's a, he's a lovely guy. But yeah, God, you know, you can't win them all. I'm learning that as a performer. You just can't win them all. But it's just kind of... Oh, I wish there weren't so many dumb. Just, I'm going to have to edit that bit, yeah. I just wish that hadn't happened because it just put a wee negative. It made me worry and it makes me think about it. It makes me double guess myself. What am I doing sometimes? You know, I mentioned in the previous episode how I am really kind of second guessing my storytelling and who I am a wee bit with that. So this is just an example of why that kind of kicks into me and makes it awkward. Anyway, enough of that. Enough, enough. Let's move on to the positive. Let's um, let's tell you one of the stories. I'm not going to tell you The Lonely Fisherman. I'm going to keep that for the uh, Valentine's uh, episode, which will be coming up shortly on my massive attempt to catch up with my podcast. So the story I thought I'd tell today isn't actually one that I told on the Burns Night. There's a huge selection of stories that I can tell. I've actually got a couple of books based in uh, the area from Ayrshire. So these are all stories certainly of Burns' time and are kind of stories he'd have probably heard. Now I started the show with a wee excerpt from Tam Shanter. So let's talk about a bridge because we all know there's a famous bridge on that. And here's a, a wee story in... You know, I kind of like this one because this is a bridge that when I was a young boy, I'd be walking back and forth across with my friends. And it was a great wee historical bridge in the town of Ayr. And I knew nothing about the story behind it until I found this little tale. So here is uh, the legend of the old brig of Ayr. Two sisters sat alone one stormy October day in a castle keep near St. John's Church in Ayr. They were trembling like the rest of Ayr's good citizens at tidings that the fleet of Hako, the king of the Norsemen, with his Viking warriors, was lying off the Cumbres of La at Largs, having moved there from the Bay of Ayr. The sisters Marion and Mary Crawford were young, beautiful and wealthy and faithfully in love with two knights of the Scottish King's force, waiting with Alexander III to do battle with the fierce Norsemen. The king was young and bold, and Richard de Boyle of Kelburn and Sandy Fraser were young and bold too, the flower of Scottish chivalry. While well, the sisters loved them for their spirit and courage, they feared for their lads when they were in battle. That morning, they had sent Alan Boyd, one of their servants, to Largs to bring back news of what was happening. Whether the two sides still stalked each other, snarling, or had finally joined battle. Now the sisters took turns of watching from their chamber window to see him when he rode home again. At last Boyd came, waving his bonnet joyfully as he rode, then throwing his reins to the stable lad, he ran upstairs two steps at a time, bringing good word to the ladies that Hako was defeated and his fleet was scattered. The battle had raged on land, in the shore shallows, and farther out too into the deeps all along the coast from Knock Castle to Porton Cross. 
but it had been at its height at Largs, where Alexander had led the final onslaught himself. Richard Kelburn and Sir Sandy Fraser had covered themselves with glory and been saluted even by the enemy. Mistress Marion gave good Alan Boyd a purse of gold and Mistress Mary drew down his rough cheek and kissed it gratefully. Make ready the greatest banquet ever held here in this castle, Marion told him. Bring out the best wines, throw on the sweetest smelling logs and turn the spit, for our lords will surely make back to us here with all speed. And home towards air, the young knights rode to the beautiful and loving women waiting for them in the castle, the squalling wind following them from rat largs, and then through the rising storm and battering, deluging rain and blatting winds, the river air rose and seeped onto the banks, breaking them down here and there all along a hundred length. The torrent surged to and forth, and common sense paused the two nights briefly. But love, love was on the other side. They were light-hearted, invincible, and flushed with victory, and they plunged their horses into the swirling river. The weary beasts fought bravely for a moment, and then... Then, with the riders, they were swept in even faster circles until the high waters carried them out to sea. The flood tide of the next morning carried their blue bodies ashore beneath the castle wall in full sight of Marion and Mary, and the ladies' chamber echoed with their weeping. The sisters never married after the tragedy, but grew old together in the castle and so that no other waiting bride or wife or mother would ever again have her life blighted, they gave their wealth to have a bridge built to loop the river where their lords had perished. It was the new bridge before long time, but it has been the old brig for much longer, and two effigies that are said to be of Marion and Mary are rounded, washed, smooth and almost undetectable now, on the outside of the most easternly parapet. That story makes a lot more sense to me now. The locations they talk about, uh, the church is, is just there, the old brig, the two statues, they are there, these two feminine forms that are just totally worn away. Sandstone, it works. I love that story because it references so many things that I know historically, the Battle of Largs, Hackle, all the Viking fleet, I know all these sort of names that are mentioned. And the fact that that's from my hometown, it's a great wee story and it's a story that burns would have been familiar with. He would have been familiar with those battles, with the excitement with Alexander. I mean, yes, he was much more in favour of characters like Robert the Bruce, but that would have been a tale that Burns would have known. And after the story, we go on to our uh, book recommendation. You know, moving on with the podcast as one should. So what book to recommend for this podcast? Well, oh, phone is beeping, honestly. Um, oh, I've been approved for something. That's lovely. Uh, another Facebook group. But our book recommendation for this episode is its probably one you won't be able to get, but I love it. It's one that helped me with a lot of Burns knowledge and uh, just one of the many books that I've got on the subject. But it was actually one. The, the story behind this is I went home and visited my mum in Presswick and Air. Now, I say Presswick and Air because they're pretty much the same place now. There's no real border other than a sign. So they're always kind of, I always class them as the same. They're miserable, dreech little towns. Um, but I was down in Air just walking about the old town, which is, jeez, it's a disaster the last time I was there. Might have improved. And I happened to walk into the wee tourist office that was there and I saw this book on Robert Burns, and it was 99 pence. And, you know, it's about a 200-page little uh, biography on Burns, and I thought, for 99 pence, you know, I'm a cheap Scotsman, I'm going to go for this. So this is the Scottish Histories Collection on Robert Burns, and it's written by Gabriel Setoun. Setoun. Sounds like a French guy. Uh, I might be wrong. Sorry, Gabriel, if you're not. 
but that wouldn't surprise me if a French guy wrote a Scottish history book. But it basically is Robert Burns is more than Scotland's national poet. See, I said. He has become a symbol of Scottish national identity whose work is still read, spoken and sung today. I mean, I've told you all this already. Burns was born and grew up in Ayrshire. His farming family led a very frugal, physically demanding life. Burns wrote poetry as an escape from these circumstances and by his mid-twenties he was an accomplished writer of verse, publishing his first work, Poems, chiefly in the Scottish dialect, in 1786. That was the name of the book. Also, I will say, he wrote poetry a lot for the women, but they don't go into that. This book details his life, loves and work of charismatic, of the charismatic figure who is, to this day, one of the best known and best loved Scottish icons. So if you didn't like Burns, you don't like Scottish, is what this book is saying. And if you don't like Scotland, you're a very strange individual indeed. But Scottish History's collection, Robert Burns, written by Gabrielle Sutun. Uh, it's a nice wee collection. I mean, it was actually only two, two pounds ninety nine to buy anyway. I got a bargain. I got it for 99 pence. It was great. I saved two, two pounds. That's like, um, what would that be the equivalent of? A couple of chocolate bars these days, probably a can of soda. I don't know. The price is ridiculous. Anyway, that is my book recommendation. If you're interested in Burns, it's a nice wee biography. It gives you a wee bit of background on him. Some nice wee pointers, some nice information. And if you can pick it up for 99 pence, hey, well done, you. That is my book recommendation for this episode of the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. And of course, immediately after the book recommendation comes our podcast recommendation. And as you know, we are part of the Alberta Podcast Network. We're a proud member, the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. And there's a huge selection of other podcasts on there. It's not just all about me, but it is. But there are some wonderful, wonderful podcasts on the Alberta Podcast Network. And the one I'm choosing to recommend is in the field of stories and storytelling today. And the podcast is City of Champions. Shane Fennessy interviews interesting people doing exceptional things in Edmonton. Tune in for art, business, sports and more. Now... Shane, I've probably misspelled your surname. Please forgive me. But City of Champions, it's one of the Alberta Podcast Network's podcasts. And this one is from Edmonton. So anyone who's a Calgarian listener, come on, let's let's give them a chance. You know, let's not do the Glasgow, Edinburgh, East West Coast thing that's out in Scotland. Let's just roll with it. We're all one great big province here. But Shane Fennessy interviews interesting people doing exceptional things in Edmonton. Tune in for art, business, sports and more. And I think that's probably one of the only podcasts that I think would be fitting for this. Burns was a champion of what he did. He loved doing poetry, but he basically was a businessman. He was a farmer, a hard worker and a public speaker he was at all. So City of Champions, an Edmonton-based podcast by Shane Fennessy about art, business, sports and more. And that is my podcast recommendation for this episode of the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. And that brings us to the end of another episode of the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. Now, spoiler alert, there may be another Burns episode next year. I, I don't want to I don't want to kind of oh, surprise you with that, but you just never know what might happen next year around the 25th of January. Oh, it could be Burns Day again. But I love Burns. I love talking about him. As I say, uh, this year was a bit of a revelation with what happened with some of the feedback. I may never do Burns again. I may have to wash my hands of Burns. I've been mortally wounded and people think I'm an awful man who supports extramarital affairs. I mean... I'm wounded. Anyway, I like doing Burns. I need to learn more of his poems. This was something that was said to me this year. So that is my goal. I'm going to try and, you know, really pick up a few of the poems, make sure I've got them off by heart in case I get asked to do some events. You know, I might need to get to Dress the Haggis. It's a dress to the Haggis. But I'm just saying I might get to Dress a Haggis because that sounds far more fun. You know, maybe, I don't know, Tutu and a tiara. Maybe dress up as a princess. Um... And then when it gets cut open, it's even more shocking. Oh, blah, blah. 
all the guts and gore. Lovely. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. There are more episodes on their way in the next days. As I say, I've still got that mission to make up time for missing all the podcasts that I've done over the last month and a half. This is a January podcast that I'm posting in March, just so you know. Thank you for listening. I hope you're staying with me. I hope to regain gain your love and trust. But thank you. I'll see you all soon on the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. Thank you.